I might get myself into trouble in this session. We'll see how we go. Um, first level assessment tools. So uh, I like quoting Feynman. He, he had lots and lots of interesting things to say. The first principle is that you mustn't fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. I used to say that over and over to my students that, you know, putting it a different way, there are times when you have to lie to your client. Yeah? You have to tell them something you know isn't the whole truth because otherwise it doesn't work. Occasionally there'll be times when you have to lie to your boss, but if you lie to yourself, you're in deep shit. <laughs> <laughs> really deep shit. Um, yeah, so there's Mexi, which is still in here, I think. It was insisted, wasn't it? They had to stay in. Um, I believe Network Rail are about to junk it, much to my joy. Uh, there's the Powser method that's in here. Um, and there's network rail level zero, and this is why I think I might get into trouble, because I think it's got very dubious value as a, a numerical approach. We'll come back to that in a minute. Mexi, where did it come from? Where's it gone? What are the boundaries? Is it in use? These words came from Pippard, who produced the method. They're looking at short-term, safe, working load. Right? They were not concerned about long-term behaviour. <laughs> This was for the army. What they were concerned about was a bridge going down with half the army over the bridge. And if you think about that, the cost of that is just unimaginable compared with the simple safety factor of killing a few people when the train goes down. The cost of getting half your army across and the other half left on this side is really quite serious. So they have no equipment, it's gotta be quick. He's gotta be reasonably satisfied that he's got a decent factor of safety and he'll get across the bridge. The method is based on the first observed crack. And you cannot see a crack that's less than a millimetre wide unless you're going over the thing with a microscope. And a millimetre is a big crack. So it isn't the first crack. If you plot, if you replot the load deflection curve for bridge mill, which is the first bridge test, um, as is the habit with people, they put a nice smooth curve through this. But if you look at it, there are three very distinct straight lines. And these are hinge form formation. I suspect there's another one here, but I'm not sure. Um, you can detect cracks here, but detecting them by eye is more difficult. And the, all the stuff in the Highways Agency stuff about archers says that there was no damage to the structure at less than half the ultimate load. Um, <laughs> excuse me? <laughs> really? I think there's real evidence. Never mind what you see. The problems that they had at the time, they only had hand calculation. At best, they only had hand calculation. There were no computers, there were no pocket calculators. You had a slide rule and you had log tables. Pippard believed very heavily in elastic analysis. And another thing that's easy to forget is the history. It was only 30 years, 35 years, since Castigliano had invented elastic analysis of arches, had found a way of doing elastic analysis of indeterminate structures. He was looking for first crack, so you need to do elastic analysis. He had a very limited test, set of test results and he worked on the basis of a bare arch. Not quite a bare arch, but we'll come back to that in a minute. They were clever people, without a doubt. Engineers in those days were clever, and they were very good at simplifying things until they could deal with them, and then dealing with the consequences of the simplification. And one of the skills that we've lost as it become easier to calculate is the skill to think about what are the implications of the simplification we've made. I think he may have gone too far. I think, I suspect he thought he may have gone too far. Um, but people who were in one way or another less clever have tried to improve it since, and there's some real trouble there. Um, so, initial statement, to estimate the accurate, accurately the carrying capacity of an existing masonry arch, a careful study of the structure and subsequent analysis is necessary. And notice he says arch, not arch bridge. 
And really, it's only relatively recently we've started to think about the structure and interaction of all the bits. This procedure is impossible under active service conditions. The engineer must be provided with the means of making a reasonably correct estimate quickly. There are many variables, shape and thickness of the ring, the ratio of the span to rise, the amount of cover, lots of other factors. Lots of sweeping assumptions were made. The results obtained are reasonable when compared with experimental data, which fortunately were available. He used an effective strip of twice the depth per, per wheel. And that was based on the graphs that I showed earlier, which may come up again this afternoon. Um, that effective strip is going to be narrowest at the crown. So one part of the assumption that he's going to use crown loading is that the effective strip is narrowest, so the effect of the concentrated load is going to be greatest. Um, he didn't use any longitudinal distribution, and he actually st said that he wasn't because they'd made too many assumptions already to start making any more. And then it was calibrated to the observed, observed first crack, and the result produced none. So they just couldn't get any correlation between the crack formation and the analysis they were doing. And eventually they came up with a rule that said, if the compressive stress at the crown gets to one ton a square inch, I think it was, then the arch will crack. Why? Is there any real relationship? But it, you know, correlation is not causation, they say, don't they? Um, but uh, that was the basis on which Mark Mexi was done. But then when you look, start to look at the bridges, we've got at least six different shapes apart from the random shape of a distorted arch. Um, and we've got a whole string of other bits and pieces like tapered rings, backing, internal spandrel walls, pierced spandrels and things like that, which engineers have to deal with. Segmental, semicircular arches, segmental arches, that's carrying railway traffic. <coughs> it's the flattest one I've come across. Uh, the abutment stretches to about here. <laughs> it's also skew, as you can see. Um, and although the voussoirs are stone, you can see there's almost no wedge on them. Uh, the arch itself is brick. It is an interesting structure, shall we say. And, and it's these limits, these boundaries, that test our understanding and allow us to explore how things really go. Um, these arches are four-centred pointed arches. There used to be four-centred pointed arches in here as well. Um, but they've taken them out and put girders in to let bigger vehicles through. Uh, that one is elliptical, that one is three-centred, and we talked this morning about the difference between the two. The calculation for Mexi was done on the basis of a parabolic shape, because otherwise the integration was beyond them. They used elastic analysis. The arch is actually, when you think about it, on the intrados. So they took the span and the rise, and they assumed the arch followed <coughs> the intrados. And it was pin-ended because, again, the sums got too hard if you tried to do it fixed-ended. Is it really pin-ended? Pippard argued that they are at the point of collapse, which is true, but at the point of collapse, the pins are in different places. Um, and then British Rail, in 1971, came along and said, oh, we've got a computer now, we can put longitude and distribution into this. And they ignored what Pippard had said about having made too many assumptions already. And then they got the sums wrong. No, they didn't get the sums wrong, they did the wrong sums. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so they took an influence line for load effect, and then they spread the load over that influence line and worked out what the effect would be on the bridge. And that has carried over into these graphs that appear in the network rail MEXI and in the UIC MEXI, although I think the new version has recalculated curves, which I did, which do the distribution correctly. What does it look like? Let's go through the pattern. So we've got a parabolic arch based on the intrados. 
we've got a depth here, we assume the surface is level and the weight at any point is based on that parabolic depth and it produces something which is reasonably easy to integrate. Um, but it's wrong <laughs> because the arch thickness isn't here, it's there. Uh, they did some fairly serious sums. And they, did, they drew a graph and said, let's fit the graph. Oh, that's a bit easier. We can deal with that one. Um, L to the 1.3, it's an interesting number, isn't it? Uh, D plus H squared. Um, and then they produced this rather nice little chart which allowed the army people, and if you've only dealt with railway bridges, you may not have seen this. Um, and it's basically a slide rule on a piece of paper. It's a single purpose slide rule. You've got a log scale here, which is the log of 1.3 times the log of L, so the log of L to the power 1.3. The center is the log of 740 H plus D squared, and the outcome comes across by striking a line across, and by striking a line across like that, you're effectively doing subtraction and therefore division. Um, the influence line for central bending moment looks like that. The loaded length that was used was for a single axle twice h plus 0.25, for a double axle twice h plus 2.25. So we're just assuming that the load distributes for the whole two meters between the axles. And actually, sorry, 2.5 means that the axles are 2.25 apart and very few of them are. So that's pretty optimistic. Um, and then you put that in the middle and quite a lot of the distribution is then in the negative part of the influence line. So you're overcompensating. The critical case really, if this is right, the critical case would be like that with a load in the middle and a load off the side producing less negative to go with this big positive. The actual worst case is probably something like that with the load at the quarter points. And what then happens is that if you look at all the distribution and things like that, and this bridge, which is clearly failing, I think, yeah, is that fair? That bridge is not capable of carrying load forever, which is what we're talking about. It failed under 22 and a half ton axles. Mexi said it would take 40 tons. Various other tools say it will take rather more. Um, and that's all about that distribution model of effective width and distribution. Um, and you only need one case that says it's wrong to say it's wrong. You can't say it's right from one case, but if one case says it's wrong, it's wrong. Mexi doesn't produce the right answer. So the distribution using the network rail system has a single axle curve and a double axle curve, so you get this sort of cusp in the, in the curve. And at the end here, it follows a reasonably sensible line, but back here, the capacity is going up and up and up. Uh, Archie using that effective width does this, which is slightly confusing, isn't it? Um, as I remember, <coughs> ring produces a very slightly different answer, but basically goes up here because the effective width isn't the ruling factor in the short spans. So all science is provisional. It's the best idea we have just now, and if we refuse to move on and say, Mex has always been good enough, uh, we are going to be stuck with these bridges that fail at loads <coughs> less than Mexi predicts. And the cost of that is actually astronomical. Because in the particular case of the Glasgow and Southwest line where those pictures were taken, Network Rail had accepted a contract to transport coal down the line. And shortly after the contract was accepted, they had to start to impose <coughs> weight limits. And the weight limits meant that the contractor holding the coal came back and said, well, that's all our profit gone. You've now got to pay us to carry coal on your trains and smash your bridges. <laughs> it's 
not a good place to be. It's a serious business. We have to get this right. The next thing we are familiar with is wrong for sensible and understandable reasons. And some of the error is carried over into other methods, and we need to get that sorted out. We need to find a way of getting better models that tell us the truth. Some bridges fail, but what's failure? I would say that's failure. I wouldn't wish to get to that state. Um, but bridges do actually fail on the load. Not very often. And that's an almost unique case. Why they chose to go over the half of the bridge that was medieval rather than the half that was only 200 years old, I don't know. Um, but this was 1946. This is the A1, which was the main trunk road between Edinburgh and London. And the sign says, no road. Um, in a country that's trying to recover from war, the economic implications of that are quite severe. The bridge has now been rebuilt. You can still see the concrete pad foundations they put in here to carry the centering to put the new span in. And that one fell down at night when nobody was looking and had been disused for many years. And again, there are lessons to be had from that, not least the fact that these bridges have lots of backing behind the arch. Um, and if you ignore the backing, the answer has to be wrong. Yeah? If you ignore parts of the structure, you are not going to get the right answer. Is it going to be conservative? Mostly yes, but occasionally no. And we have to be careful about that. So my argument is that MEXI isn't fit for purpose. It provides a wrong safe capacity. It tells you nothing on which to base judgment because it's a black box. And I think it's irresponsible to use it in 2018, whatever the UIC says in its code. The powers of method is another black box. The URBB had it developed by Prof Pauser in Vienna. I know nothing about it. I can't offer you either criticism or recommendation. It's there in the code because it had, and this is what I was saying about the fact that the code is the best answer we can agree on five years ago when we did it. Network Rail Level Zero is worth talking about here because a lot of you are from Network Rail, and I don't doubt very much whether anyone has properly talked about the way it was developed. It's based on ArchEM, so I should be defending it. People developed a secondary program which ran Archie thousands of times with different spans, different risers, different ring thicknesses, different fill properties, and then produced a formula for the results. And that formula is now built into a spreadsheet. So what we're doing, we're taking a method which, about which we have some doubt, but which, because it at least produces a picture, gives you something on which to base your judgment, and we're closing it into a black box. And, and I'm really not happy about that. And I was very unhappy from the start. Um, I did take part in the project. I asked for permission to tell Network Rail that I wasn't happy with it, but it, I was promised that, and then it was denied me. <laughs> so here I am saying, <laughs> it isn't right. Um, and at one point, the surface fit that was about to be published was clearly wrong. We plotted the surface, and the surface was just ridiculous. It had ridges across it, and there were, you could get a factor of two difference in capacity by increasing the strength by 20 millimeters. So it was clearly increasing the thickness by 20 millimeters. It was clearly wrong. The other side of that is that the system behind the level zero has allowed the systematic gathering of vast amounts of useful data. And that in itself is worth the process. So the, the gathering of a systematic pattern of stuff is really worthwhile, and I'm glad that that's been done. So on to RGM, which is my work. I've forgotten how long I've got. I'm going to shuffle on a bit. Um, I sell it. I support it. A lot of what I learn about archers comes from talking to people about the Archie assessments that they do. We began work on it in 1984 because I was working on Wade's Bridge in Aberfeldy and it was clear that the assessments that were being done were nonsense and around that time Jacques Heyman in Cambridge did the 
four-hinge mechanism analysis and published it. And I said, well, we can do that much faster on a computer. Um, and then computers developed quite fast and it became possible. Um, we extended from the line of thrust to the zone of thrust to say well, you really do need some material there to carry the thrust where it hits the edges. So effectively you use a slightly reduced ring thickness. And then the multi-span thing, which I said this morning how I'd got that wrong, came in in sort of 88, 89. And the main issue with it is it uses the same effective strip model that just two or three minutes ago I was saying is wrong. In most circumstances, it's conservative. If the, if the span is reasonably long, it's conservative. It's only on very short spans that the effective strip is too generous. Um, but it is too generous on short spans. Um, so my design aims with Archie, it had to be quick to use. It had to encourage people to explore parameters. So I was working on the basis that we don't actually know. We don't know how thick the ring is. We don't know whether there's backing. We don't know the condition of the fill. We don't know the masonry strength. Juggle with the numbers and decide when, you've, when you're confident. Because it's a question of confidence, not knowledge. Are you confident the bridge is OK? Fine. So the whole basis was to do something quick. Um, but it needs a bit of a demonstration. So there isn't time to do it properly, so we just have to look at it here. Um, so what we have is, as I say, a zone of thrust. The thickness of this band represents the scale of force divided by the specified strength of the material. Um, the load can be dragged across. <laughs> These little vectors say how much load has been applied to which block. They aren't voussoirs, they're just blocks of masonry. Um, and shows you the pattern of distribution of load from these wheels down onto the arch. We fudged the distribution. Dealing with a rectangular distribution is fine in hand calculations. It's an absolute pig in a computer. Um, so we produced a sine wave that has the same central effect as a rectangle. And that meant it tailed out to nothing. Um, and that means when you, oops, when you combine two loads like this, you don't have to worry about whether or not they overlap and produce different answers. Uh, and one level of that is that if you were able, as you are with Archie, to drag the load across like this and watch the thrust line change, if the distribution kept changing, so you get a step change in distribution as your load coincides, because the rule says if the two overlap, you treat it as a UDL over the whole length, and you move from this to this, instantly, you'd see that as you dragged it across. It would go, and that's not going to give you any confidence. So we had to find a way around that. Um, where are we going next? We're looking to produce some better distribution. We're looking at a cantilever and defend, dis, suspended span model for viaducts on the basis of the stuff I was talking about this morning. Um, there's some heavy analysis going on by Imperial College. We're hoping over the next year or two to do some physical measurement of behavior to go in with that analysis and produce something which becomes defensible. OK? Yeah? Um, and where are we now? It really needs a demo, but we have to do it this way. Um, this is built for an iPad. The analysis here is at this line across the bridge. Here is a four axle bogey. Bridge is this wide, the span is from here to here, and I think I'm going to have to try and... No, if I just go back, go on back and do it again, you'll see the analysis is starting right at the top. We get a peak in the thrust line here. It dips a bit, comes back to a peak with the load where the wheels are, and then drops away to almost dead load effect further over here. But it's a progressive thing. Um, and what happens is that with any remotely rational load you can apply here, you never lift the thrust away from the interloss at this point. I, it's quite an interesting difference. Um, but it does mean that we're going to have to find a different failure criterion if the failure criterion is cracks forming here rather than a mechanism. Back to poor Mr Pippard's problem. OK, I'm happy to discuss that. 
There are various links, as I've said earlier, at that thing. And there's my email address. Do email me if there's anything you want to argue, argue about. I think that's me. <laughs> <laughs>